Then the tenant, tenant one, use role one. I've differentiated all those names for separation space, but in general, if there's one user in a tenant or a project, then the project that they're in and the username that they have match. If there's a grouping of people, then each, each person would have their own user and then the tenant would have a more descriptive name of you know, my project team or something like that. And then again, the roles are usually predefined. We don't create a lot of those. Um, and then if you have a new user on the command line, you can then copy that RC admin file to RC underscore username, update the username and password, and then use that. So you can see here, I've created a new RC file with the new user. Uh, I've sourced it so that those environment variables go, are, are set. And then I can log, I can get a token as my new user. I can source the admin file. And then down here at the bottom, almost cut off, I'm back as the admin user again. So that's just a quick example of the command line of how you would get started to be able to do more of um, the rest of everything, basically. <laughs> uh, so let's add a user. We're back in our installation of OpenStack we just finished here. Down at the bottom, there's an identity panel. I'm going to create a user. And give you my email so everyone can spam me with lots of questions. Now, I've got two projects already existing. One here is for the administrator, and one is a services project. The services project is for all those components in OpenStack. Like I said, everything is a member of a tenant. Everything is a member of a project. So all those components have users that they're doing authentication between each other, and all those users for the components are members of that services tenant. So the services tenant is kind of a general purpose um, cluster project for things that are cluster related. And so we're going to use that later in networking for something that ends up being general purpose use for the entire cluster. So at this point, what I'm going to do, as I suggested for just my user, is create a tenant specifically for me. There's a bug in RDO that the patch is already in upstream, but hasn't been released by the community yet. And so I'm going to fix that real quick with a script that I threw in here. And all it's doing is updating this member piece here that the default member in Packstack has changed from this to that. And so that's why I got that error, if you notice that red box. So let's try it again. The services tenant? Yeah. No, it's the services tenant is the same as all the other tenants. It's just created for all of the components or all the services in OpenStack to be a member of a tenant. So it's it's not better or higher or anything. It's just you have to everything has to exist in a tenant. And so that services tenant is for the services users to exist in a tenant. Yeah, exactly. So, so all, all services like users have to be authenticated. And so this is kind of a uh, a place you can put them and then they can run through Keystone to get the, they all have to be authenticated to Keystone just like a regular user would have to be so this is a, a way to do, help do that so here the dashboard has given me a new window to create my tenant so I'm creating a tenant with the same name as my user and then it will yeah by the way again it's, it's a little confusing but in, in over the various releases of OpenStack people have gone back and forth between calling these groupings of resources a project or a tenant. So sometimes you'll see project, sometimes you see tenant. Sometimes the CLI will say one thing, and then the dashboard equivalent will say another thing. But actually, it's the, they're talking about the same construct. So I've selected so as my question over there. Sure. Uh, OK. I think the question is whether there's role-based access control. So right now there isn't. There's basically an admin and a user. There is a project uh, part. Of the, I think in the Keystone three, um, there is talk about doing role, creating specific role-based access to specific resources within a particular tenant or pro slash project. Yeah. So at this point, admin or member is kind of where you're at. But there's plans to have 
different access for different users. So I've selected my, my tenant, my project that I've created, and I've selected the member role so that I have, basically if I gave myself administrative role, then I'd be an administrator for the cluster. If I give myself a member role, then I'm a member of the project. So we'll create the user. Uh, this is again another bug that's fixed upstream and is, is going to be pulled into RDO. For this demo, it shouldn't hurt us. It's basically trying to add the user to the tenant twice. And so it succeeds and then it fails because it already has the role. So at this point, we should be able to log out from the administrator and log in as my new user, Radies, with the password that I had created. So now, as a not administrative user, you see there's no tabs for the administrative um, pieces of OpenStack. You just have the tabs in the menu on, on that side of the screen, your left, that are for end users to create all the pieces of OpenStack to build out instances. So if you logged into TriStack, this is the interface that you would get. So next we'll talk about Glance. Again, it's that registry for those pre-built images so that when you launch an instance, you can just pull a copy of that image and launch off of it instead of having to do a whole installation of an operating system. You can customize these images. So if you had, um, say, a web server and you wanted to pre-bake an image that had the web server and all the packages already installed so that all you had to do was a few configuration pieces for that particular instance when it launches, then you could build those packages into it. Um, this is an example of how you would import an image on command line. I think the create name here is a little bit misleading because you're not actually creating the image file itself. You're creating record of it in the registry. Uh, and then you can do a list of the glance files after you've imported it. And there is an, oh, okay. Sorry. I think you're, we're going to talk about that next. Creating the image. Yeah, so there's, there's lots of different ways you can create these images. I used vert install to do the images for this demo. Um, Oz is one that's very similar. Here's a bunch of them. It's something that um, takes time and patience because you're building an entire operating system into a tiny little image. I actually have a blog post on this. If you search my name uh, and image building on Google, um, there's a, a blog post on how I created the disk images for um, this demo. The important <laughs> thing if you're building your own image is to include Cloudinit. Um, Cloudinit is a service that on boot, the image will launch Cloudinit service. And the Cloudinit service calls back into OpenStack to get post boot information and configuration about the instance. Um, what's, this is very important to authenticate to your machines because in the cloud we generally use SSH keys to get into the instances. Cloudinit is the piece on the instance that calls back into OpenStack to get that SSH key and put it into the authorized keys so that you can then log into your instance. I don't actually know. That, um, how do you authenticate to the Windows machines? Good question. SSH keys. I, I guess you would bake the image with passwords and users that you know and are able to authenticate with. Use LDAP. Use LDAP would be another way, yeah. Oh, a callback, like a cloud init service for Windows. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, you could spin up a guest instance that would then connect to an Active Directory environment. Um, I've just obviously labeled myself as a very narrow-minded Linux guy, haven't I? <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, so great question. I, I don't have an answer for you, though. I'm sorry. So let's add an image. We'll jump into back into the, the dashboard here. I'm going to select images. I'm going to click my create image box. Can you guys see this OK? A little bigger? A little bigger would be good. Um, I'm going to call it Fedora, and I'm going to select a file from my laptop. Pull down the image. This is the same file that I put on those flash drives that are being passed around. Um, so if, if you haven't gotten one of those flash drives, look for one. Put your hand up so people can pass it to you. And this is an image that you can use on... Um, if you do this later, you're welcome to use this image. It's a, a 200 meg 
image of Fedora and the root password is not very secure in under uh, all lowercase letters, all one word. In case you need that to debug, because you do. I do. Um, so I've, I've selected my Fedora image here. I've selected its format. I'm going to label it as a public image. If it's a public image, it means that anyone can use it. If you don't label it public, then only the tenant that it's in can use it. And the protected flag is kind of a read-write flag that if something's protected, you can't delete it. You have to unprotect it before you can delete it. Even the owner of it has to turn off the protected flag before it can be deleted. So create image, it's going to upload this file into my OpenStack cloud. And now I have an active image ready for me to do an installation off of, uh, a, a launch. So next we'll look at Neutron. Before we can actually launch this instance, we need the, the Glance image to boot off of, and we need a network for it to exist on so that we can get into this instance. So Neutron is our networking service, and it's, it's networking as a service. It's virtual network appliances and networks, and it is intended to be isolated so that um, the old style of networking, all the instances came up on a flat network together, and so they could all talk to each other. When we move to Neutron, because we have these virtual isolated networks, you can now isolate these instances from each other, so tenant A can't talk to tenant B unless there is provision for it specifically made for those two to route to one another. Um, it, it's again a very modular component. So under the covers here, I'm going to use Open vSwitch as, as the networking backend for it, which is a, a virtual net, uh, switching appliance. Um, but there are plugins for Neutron to be able to use your vendor of choice that supports OpenStack to use switches and routers and other hardware so that you don't have to rely on Open vSwitch if you choose not to. So let's add a network. Select networks, create network. I'm going to call this internal because this is our, our unroutable set of IPs. And I'm going to give it a 172.16.00.24 address. And I'm going to go ahead and put a DHCP, or a, I'm sorry, a DNS server, Google's DNS server of 88888. Um, because we're providing DNS, uh, DHCP to the instances through this network here, it'll provide the, those DNS name servers to the instances. So now we have a virtual network named internal. Everybody say, yay. yay. Yeah, you guys are great. The other thing that I need in networking before I can launch an instance is a router. A router is important because the metadata service that CloudInit calls back into is functions through that router. So I create my virtual network for the instance to live on, and I create a router, and I, I create that route from the internal network to the router. And then when the instance comes up, it goes out to DHCP and gets its address. And then when CloudInit comes up, it's able to call into that router and therefore get forwarded into that metadata proxy, uh, the metadata service to get the SSH key or post boot configuration. So I'm going to create a router for my tenant. I'll very creatively call it the same thing as my username and tenant name. I'm going to select my router and add an interface. An interface is a connection to our internal networks that we have. So I'll select my internal network. And then there's a cool little topology visual piece here that you can see. So we've got over here, we've got our, our internal network. And we've got the router that it's connected to. And it'll give us information. So we'll kind of build out the network on this visualization as we go so you can see how networking fits together. Networking is by far the most complicated part of OpenStack. So I'm going to ask if you have questions about it. Let's see how much time we have at the end. And I'll absolutely stick around to discuss it. Um, but we could rat hole on networking for the rest of our 45 minutes if, uh, without trying very hard. Correct. Mm -hmm. I covered that, so I'll give you a buy on that. <laughs> um, so we've got a network, we've got a router, which means we've got an instance and we've got networking, we can now launch an instance. So let's get into Nova and actually look at our instance management. Nova knows about all the compute nodes and it has scheduling to make an educated decision on where to put your instance. 
It's designed to scale horizontally, so the idea here is with my single controller and single compute node architecture that I'm building, if I had the capability to scale that out, I could add more compute nodes and go three, four, ten, however many compute nodes. So, so physically speaking, you could imagine a server that's a controller and then 12 compute nodes underneath it, which is almost exactly the architecture of TriStack. And if you needed more con compute nodes, you go beyond that. So it fits into the, the idea that OpenStack in general is intended to scale horizontally and to work on standard hardware. So these servers that you run your compute nodes on, as long as they have the processor capability and enough memory and some disk space, right, fairly standard stuff you get in all computers, um, you don't need any special hardware necessarily. You just need kind of off-the-shelf stuff. And because virtualization is so prevalent in computing today, I mean, really, any server that you purchase is going to have the capability for OpenStack to be able to run on it. Yeah. So, as an example, um, uh, on our Rackspace's public cloud, we've got tens of thousands of compute nodes and several hundred thousand VM instances running across them, and it's one single cloud managed by one sing uh, single set of controllers, control planes. What's that? All of your hosts are physical nodes, nodes he asked. asked. All, all the nodes themselves. Yeah, so we do OpenStack on OpenStack. So, um, yeah, so we've got an OpenStack environment that's managing an OpenStack environment that's all bare metal, and then we're running virtual machines on top. So yes, your control node would be a physical server. Your compute yeah. node would be a physical server. And so I, I'm doing it virtually here demo-wise, but if you're actually going to run this in a way that you wanted end users to use it, then each of these nodes you'd want to be physical pieces of hardware. And really a most basic architecture for you to deploy on bare metal is really recommended to have a compute node and a network node and a um, control node so that your API services are separated from your networking services, are separated from your yeah. compute services, and then you don't have resource contention for those kind of logical separations of the pieces of OpenStack. Yes, exactly. The, the L2 and L3 agents are um, kind of a, a central piece that everything networking talks back into, and so you really want that on its own node where it can not compete with the API services or computing services and let it just do networking. It, it can, it doesn't have, like the API server you mean? It, you can put it in either place, they're, they're, it's very modular, so um, I think Red Hat's default installation puts the Neutron API server on the control node. Um, currently on TriStack I have the API server running on the network so node, it doesn't really matter. So just give you an example, a, um, obviously it's use case dependent, I mean, you could go as small as just one control node and one, one or two compute nodes, but uh, in a, uh, what I would consider a true production deployment, we would probably, rec for example, recommend five controller nodes, bare metal. Three of them would be running uh, like the API service, the uh, RabbitMQ and the database uh, in a quorum uh, cluster setup, and then you would actually want two network nodes uh, because the network nodes actually act as the gateway for your VMs to be able to get, get out to the outside world. So if you lose the one network node, you don't have a second one, basically it's, it's as good as your VM being down, right? From the perspective of your client. Um, can I talk about live migration later? Thanks. Right, so the compute nodes will all talk, all the instances that live on the compute nodes, so compute, again, compute nodes is just hypervisor nodes. Right. They all route, the, as they need to talk to the L3, they route their way to one of, one of the network nodes, which is one's the L3 agent, and that is, that is connected to an external provider network. So again, if that goes down, you basically lost and, access to your to And that's layer. a known limitation of Neutron. We, we realize, Neutron team realizes that that's kind of a central point of contention for networking traffic to always have to go back through that networker. Um, and so there's, there is work to resolve that going on. So to be honest, in some very large, this, this will all get fixed eventually. 
uh, in very large Im implementations. I actually use Nova networks, partly because the way Nova works is you can make each hypervisor know basically an L3, like a gateway to the outside world, right? But then you don't, you don't get some other functionality. So again, Neutron is a maturing project, is <laughs> the best way I can put it. Um, let, let's get into the more details of yeah, that a little later. Let's keep moving here. We've got a lot to cover yes still. Yes and no. Well, so, um, <laughs> using Nova at the command line, you, have, you can list flavors. We'll talk about flavors in just a minute. You can add a key pair. So the SSH key pairs I was talking about, you can add those and list them. Um, you can actually list, uh, Nova list here, you can list your glance images through Nova. Um, here's an example of booting on the command line, and there's an example of listing your instances on the command line. So let's actually do that in the web interface. Select my compute menu, jump on instances, launch an instance. How about we name it super test just for fun? Or demo, that would be exciting too. My instance, come on, help me out, what's a better one? I'm going to select an in my, uh, I'm, I'm going to boot from an image as my source. I'm going to select that Fedora image that I just imported. Here's the idea of a flavor here that we can see visually, that when you, when you boot an, an instance, you need to define what resources are going, to be, are going to be given to it, how many vCPUs, how, many, how much memory is going to be allocated, how much disk. And so you can select these different flavors. These are all put in there by Packstack for us to choose from. You can create your own as well. Okay, and one of the key, key concepts of flavors is, uh, so one of the key tenets is as you manage a cloud at scale, the more customization you have, the harder it is to manage, right? It's, uh, if you want to manage at very large scale, you need to simplify things as much as possible. So what we don't want is 20,000 different types of VMs running in your cloud. You want to keep it to a very small subset, so that's the idea behind flavors. Basically saying, creating a service catalog of, of available resources and saying, you know, medium, small, large, small, medium, large, extra large, take your pick. And, and kind of reducing it to that very small subset, because then it's much easier for you to manage the environment. So next I'm adding a key pair here. You can generate a key pair similar to AWS where it'll be generated in the cloud and downloaded and then you use those keys. Uh, here I'm just importing my, um, a, a key that I use on my laptop. Give me one sec, I'll get to you. Um, we switch over to, uh, the other thing to notice here is that on this um, access and security, there's a default security group being defined and allocated to our instance that's being launched. A security group is kind of a cloud level firewall for your tenant and we'll see how that works um, when, when we connect to the instance in a little bit. Networking wise, we're going to use our internal network that we created. Post creation is cloud init, so if you put um, a script, you know, typed out a script here in this customization script, then when CloudInit pulls down the metadata from the metadata server, this would be part of it and it would execute it on the, the server. So you could see how you could invoke a configuration management engine or run a couple pieces of, of bash code that would customize things to join a node into a cluster of some kind or something like that. So I'm going to hit launch here. And in this spawning process here, what's actually happening is the, that disk image that we've put on the control node is being copied over and cached to my compute node. And then it's spawning a virtual instance using those virtual resources. And in, uh, because we're doing nested vert, this will take a minute or so. Um, and in a real world environment, it goes much faster. But we should have a running instance here in uh, just a little bit. So let's move forward. What was the question you had over here? It is. So what do I need to do to make sure that that image, I mean, is important and it's important and it's important? If he has, like, an ESX image, can he run it on KVM? Um, so I'll let you take you this. You've fought up a subject, so <laughs> the 30 little s <laughs> Actually, the 30 can, little secret. Can, okay, can I interrupt you? So, so we can make it through this. Um, why don't we chat with that later in the question session? Let's try and keep yeah. questions specific to what we're doing here and then getting beyond what we're doing. Um, yeah. Let's wait for afterwards because we still have a long way to go. I'm sorry. Did you have a question I can't wait? Or? Yeah. Could I create a bootable module? 
Yes. Yeah, that, that would be part of the, you can do that in the, in the Cinder block storage service uh, component. So we can talk about that later. So we'll underneath the, the covers, we've got a virtual network that our instance is running on, but that's an, that's an unroutable network. We can't get to that network from anywhere. So what we have to do now is kind of connect the outside world into this network. So let's walk through that. The way this happens is ETH0 is going to represent kind of my, my physical interface on my node, on my networker node. And then BREX is a predefined bridge in Open vSwitch. And so what we have to do is plug these two into each other. So it, it's called adding a port to Open vSwitch. So we're going to take ETH0 and add it as a port into Open vSwitch. Um, and to do that, we also have to move the IP address over because what happens is OVS will take control of ETH0 and still pass traffic through it, but bridge external will be the actual device that you communicate with the IP address. So what I'm going to end up doing here is on ETH0, I'm going to strip out the IP information that I currently have on my machine so it ends up looking like this. So you'll see we're still going to bring up the interface on boot. And then bridge external, I'm going to, that should be on boot, yes. I'm going to move that IP information over to my bridge external device and make sure that it boots, and then I'll run an OVS command, add port, to add ETH0 into bridge external as a port, and then the, net, the service network restart over there is kind of a cheating way to bounce these interfaces. All you really need to do is bounce the interfaces. But the reason you need to do that is because when OVS gets ETH0 plugged into it as a port, OVS takes control of that device and therefore we lose connectivity on it. And that's why Packstack can't set this up for it because Packstack is running over SSH and it has an active puppet session that it's using. So if we broke that SSH connection and therefore the puppet installed, then Packstack would be dead in the water. So we're doing this afterwards. And so when I lose connectivity on that port, my port will already be plugged into Open vSwitch because I've completed my add port command but then I'm going to bounce that ne those network services so that those two interfaces, ETH0 and bridge external, get turned over and the IP information gets moved off of ETH0 onto bridge external and therefore traffic will flow all the way through. This was the most complicated part of understanding Neutron for me. So if that was really quick and didn't make sense, come see me afterwards and I'll try and help walk through what took me a really long time to understand. <laughs> So once we actually get this done, we can jump into OpenStack and create a virtual external network that will represent this connection that we've made to the outside world on our public subnet. And then we should be able to ping an SSH into our instances. So let's work, that, work through that. I'm going to look on my, now I'm doing this on my control node. Uh, more, uh, to be more correct, this should be done on the network node, but my control and my network node are, are the same in this demonstration. You cannot, because this is underlying networking infrastructure, it's not OpenStack management. It gets back to why I said 80% of the stuff you can do in the GUI, 90-some percent CLI, 100% API. So it's, it's, again, it's the idea that at scale, you don't want to use the GUI too uh, very often, to be honest. So I'm editing my config my, my network script files for Ethernet zero and bridge external. So you can see currently I've got the IP address on my ETH0 device. So I'm just going to take that IP address and gateway off. And now I'm looking at my bridge external device and I've pre-populated this for sake of speed. So all I did was take the exact information that was in ETH0, my IP gateway and net mask, and moved it over into that bridge external device. And then I'm going to this is not related to instances. This is underlying networking infrastructure that the instances will use. No, this is a, a one-time <laughs> thing for the cluster. Once it's set up, then all the instances use it. Mm -hmm. It is a, this essentially this is the this is the admin setting up the underlying infrastructure. The users don't ever worry about this, right? The users just make an API call to say launch an instance. And then they, and then oh, API, and then the the uh, request will go out and pull all the pieces together. There's a, this is the it, well, 
is rather complicated. <laughs> but it, it has to do with uh, setting up IP security at the VM level. Um, you need to use IP tables and. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, the way Neutron is, it's, there's like several places where uh, services are being handled. So it, it creates a lot of creates a lot of layers, that's the way I'll put it. So I did the, the add port here, and for a minute it kind of hung and didn't say anything for me. That's where we lost the SSH connectivity and SSH was trying to reconnect. Then the network was restarted and those two interfaces came back up. And so when my SSH connection here was reestablished, that showed that moving the IP address off of the physical interface onto the virtual OVS interface worked properly, and that I'm now talking to this node through Open vSwitch instead of directly through the uh, Linux networking. I'm sorry? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we've got, um, it's really big. So you can see ETH0 right there. Doesn't have an IP address on it, but its state is up. And then there's bridge external down there that now has my 122.101 IP address that I connected to the dashboard with initially. So at this point, we've done underlying infrastructure for the networking, and we have to make OpenStack aware that we've done this. We have to tell it that there is a block of IP addresses that is routable from the outside world that you can now use a subset of those IP addresses, create an allocation pool, so that they can be distributed to the instances as floating IPs. I know that was a big mouthful, and we're going to actually work through what that means. So I'm going to jump back into OpenStack's dashboard and log back in as the administrator. That's because external networks can only be added by the administrator um, because it's related to underlying subsystem that we had to do, right? So as the administrator, I'm gonna select networks. I'm gonna create a network. I'm gonna call this external. Was that exciting? Everybody say, yeah, you're so funny. <laughs> and so here's the place where we get back to that services tenant. That the external network is a general purpose external network for all tenants to use. And so putting, labeling it as in external ends up giving it to everybody, but we don't want it to come up listed as a network that they can attach instances to. So what we do is we put it in the services tenant where no one's gonna try and launch an instance because it's specific to services. And therefore we use this generic cloud tenant for all of our subcomponents of OpenStack to house this external network because everything in OpenStack has to be a member of a tenant. So I've created a network, um, and you saw with the user, we kind of did the subnet creation in the same swoop in that box. Here you have to add the subnet separately. So I've created an, an external network, but I'm gonna go in and create a subnet now with it too. And so I'm gonna use my 192.168.122 network where I'm connecting to my dashboard. We're just gonna kind of pretend that that's our externally public publicly routable set of IPs. And then on subnet detail, I'm gonna disable DHCP because OpenStack's gonna assume that the IP addresses it pulls out of this allocation pool are statically assigned. They're not provided by any DHCP agent. If I left this checked, then OpenStack would try and launch a DHCP agent inside of this virtual network, which we don't want because it's provided to us by our network administrators. And then we have to tell it to so, use- sorry, thanks for the <laughs> I'm assuming after this, Dan's going to show a topology map, and it'll probably be a little easier to figure out what, what exactly what we're doing. Yeah, I'll go back to that visualization yeah, that we did I'll, before, I'll. had planned to, so that we can, we can see what it looks like. Thanks, Ken. Um, I'm, the, I'm the administrator right now. Of the whole system, of the whole system correct. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm telling this the wrong thing. So what I've done now is said, in my 122 subnet, only use IP addresses 200 through 254. Um, and so that would represent a static block of IP addresses provided by a network administrator for your cloud to use. So now I have a subnet inside of my external network. It's labeled as an external network. 
And now what we want to go, to go do is go back into our end user tenant and connect this external network into our tenant so that we can now route traffic from the outside into our instance. So I'm going to sign out from the administrator, log back in as me. And the way we do this is to connect it by way of that router. So we looked at the topology before where we had an internal network and you can see our instance here, you can see our router, and we have our external network over here, but there's nothing routing traffic between the two of them. So what we'll do is we'll attach a route to our router to that external network, and therefore traffic will be able to flow from the outside to the so inside. Before you go, how many of you, is there anyone here who um, work with VMware technologies at all? A bunch of you, okay. Uh, do you know vCloud Director? So I conceptually, so this is very similar conceptually, so can you want to go back to the topology real quick? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Sure we'll get it. I'm getting so excited. Yeah, I know. So this external <laughs> network, right, is, is a provider network. It's basically a um, map to an actual, real, external network that goes out to the outside world. And then in each tenant will have their own internal network, right, that, uh, that allows the VMs to only access other VMs within that, that tenant. And then what we're basically doing is gonna, we're going to create a route using a, virtu a virtual router that will connect this internal network to this external network, which is a really a virtual network that's mapped to a real, real, true external network. And so when VMs need to access the outside world or vice versa, it walks, works from this internal network through the virtual router to this external network, which then connects to a, a real physical infrastructure and out to the internet. And I think a good clarification was mentioned before that the external network only has to be done once. So if we went through the process of creating a new user again, and this user created an internal network and launched an instance, the state that we're in right now is where is with that external network is where all users will be that are created and, the, and then used. So we, we do this external network creation once, and all new users, all new tenants will have access to this external network to then create routes to it. So the thing that the end users has to do is create the internal network and create the router to the external network. So that external network will always be provided now that we've created it. Absolutely. With the caveat that if you're trying to do it over SSH, you'll, uh, you might have a little bit of trouble. But absolutely scripting that. And Really, providing that external network access is something that's done before you give internal users or, or end users access. So to attach that router to my external network, I just click Set Gateway and collect my, or select the external network. And then if we look back at that topology, now that router has been connected to the external network and we have the route from the external network into the internal network. So what we do now is the, the, I, the instance on the inside has a private IP that was unroutable before. So we'll assign it a floating IP address on, that public access, on the, the, the public network. And then OpenStack will route traffic for us from that floating IP into that instance so we can talk to it. So let's do that now. I'm going to go back and select my instance and say associate floating IP. It tells me there's no IP addresses available. This is specific to the tenant. What that means is there hasn't been an IP address allocated to the tenant yet because everything has to exist in the tenant before I can actually do the association. So I click my plus button and it give, brings me to the allocate IP address, uh, allocate floating IP dialog. Allocate an IP. Now I have a list of IPs that are been allocated to my tenant. I select the one given to me and it's connected to the super test port and click associate and now that IP address will come up down here. So at this point you might be thinking, yay, let's ping the instance because we'd like to talk to it. Yeah. Man, you guys are awesome. I'm here all week. <laughs> so it doesn't ping. And this is important because we have to go back to those security groups that we talked about before. Remember that I said there's that firewall at the cloud level? If we connect access and security, and I've already got that default group. So here's that default security group that was allocated to my instance when it was launched. 
If we manage rules, then we can add a rule for ICMP. So I'm selecting all ICMP traffic be allowed here. And while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and do SSH too, because if everything worked, <laughs> then we should be able to SSH too. So now I have two new rules. Here is my SSH rule, and right above it is my ICMP rule. And apparently I've done something horribly wrong because it's not working. Um, so the sake of time, instead of debugging us, what was supposed to happen was it would ping there and then we could SSH to it. Um, this is actually a great place for us to talk about looking at the instance when you can't get to the network. If I select my instance in my project, there's a console tab over here which will give me Well, that's why it can't connect. It's not running. <laughs> so, look, I debugged on the console. Yay! <laughs> In Hong Kong, there was a guy giving a networking demonstration, and he started to ping in the demonstration, and everyone erupted, and he was like, man, that was the best response I've ever gotten from a ping. So that, this is the best response I've ever gotten from a console. <laughs> um, so let me try and relaunch this just for fun and see if it is... Yes? For the sake of time, we're probably going to have to do the sender and then end there and just see if we want to have people okay. who are going to ask questions. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that depends. It's, in the underlying architecture, that's kind of a whole different topic. OpenStack takes care of that for you as the end user. So, uh, Neutron in particular, I think can leverage um, kind of quote unquote old fashioned VLANs, but typically it's used to create virtual networks, which is a, ne a network overlay sitting on top of your physical network, which is using a, a VLAN. Does that make sense? So the idea is you, you can set up your, v, you set up your VLANs as you would in a non-cloud world, but then Neutron's actually creating additional virtual networks that sits on top. And the main reason you want to do that is, uh, believe it or not, 4,000 VLANs is not enough for certain environments. So because they're looking to try to do very large scale, um, to, in theory, a, a using Neutron with virtual networks, you could actually scale to millions of, v, of virtual networks in the same VLAN space. Yeah, as the end user, you don't need to worry about the VLAN. And I'm not using VLANs as the transport underneath. I'm using GRE tunnels. So in GRE tunnels, the tags are all taken care of for you by the infrastructure. Um, if you're going to do VLANing, then it's, again, another topic beyond you would use a, a different network transport between your nodes underneath instead right. of GRE. And then you're, and then you're limited. So let's, let's keep going. Um, we can do storage hopefully fairly quickly and it appears that the instance is actually booting this time. So let me do all the storage and then I can go back and do the demonstration on Cinder and that's, that'll be all I have. So hopefully we'll have a minute or two for um, lots of wonderful questions because you guys are awesome. All right, so Cinder's our, our persistent block storage. You can do snapshotting. Basically, you're going to create a virtual device as shown here, and then you're going to attach to your instance that device. It's going to show up just as a normal block device on your machine. So on my Linux machine, I'll have VDA for my, my um, OS disk, and VDB will show up as the sender block device. Um, and then what you would do is, is use it as any other block device, right? So you'd, you'd uh, create a file system on it and create partitioning tables on it, and you would mount it somewhere and you would use it and then if you are done with it you can then detach it from you can make sure it's unmounted and then detach it from your instance um, so I'm going to skip this create attach mount real quick and let that instance finish booting up um, and talk about Swift so Swift is our other storage this is object storage where senders that block device that gets um, presented to your machine with Swift you would install a client and then do API calls out to Swift to get uh, simple content. So um, with, with the block device, there's lots of metadata. It's a full functioning block file system. Uh, Swift is, is very simple storage. And so the magic of Swift is, is more so under the covers that your, your backing store for that is going to do replication and mirroring and striping and 
Um, you can create very large storage infrastructure underneath Swift uh, if you can live with having just that simple content in, simple content out uh, interaction with the Swift. Yeah, what I think storage. of it is, is so send a block storage is basically a SCSI device for your cloud instance slash VM. Swift, however, is, uh, uh, is storage for unstructured data that's actually presented to your applications, not to a specific VM. Uh, so a uh, use case for Swift, for example, would be if you had to store mil like millions and millions of images, right? You wouldn't want to do that. You wouldn't, couldn't do that in a block system, and you actually wouldn't even want to do it in the file system because the file system can't handle millions and millions of images. Whereas with Swift, you can, ha you can store all those millions of images on the single namespace and be able to access them. So. So here's an example of using Swift at the command line. Um, and I'm going to do it in the web interface instead for you. Uh, looking at the console here, you can see we have actually booted. And you can see that cloud init spawned. And down here, you can see at the very big the big bottom, the bottom, it has pulled down my SSH key and put it onto the instance. So let's look. The image has to have it installed. Is that sort of a standard thing that you find in Linux now? Mm -hmm. okay. It is. I think I installed it directly out of the Fedora, the, the Fedora repos. So I'm going to create, uh, first I'm going to do sender here. So I'm going to create a test volume. And I'm just going to make it a gig large. There's types and there's more configuration you can do with sender depending on what kind of backing store you use for it. So that's what all those other uh, boxes are. We obviously can't get into it with the time we have left. So at this point I could say atta uh, edit attachments and select my test instance. And there's another message I have never seen before. <laughs> Live demos. So let's just use the console. So you had a question? Yeah, just had a question about the comment on the back store. If you were to add another back store, it's going to be sender instance. Go ahead and easily start it. Would that be restarted? Restart it to take the back end? Yep. There is. <laughs> it's a whole other topic. <laughs> but yes, there is. <laughs> So, uh, so actually, so we kind of skipped over it. Uh, whenever you uh, launch an instance, there is a root disk that's called an ephemeral disk that's uh, typically typically sits on lo the local attached storage within the server. Compute you node. Know. Although it could also sit on an NFS mount. Um, then that's where things boot up. You can if you can choose to boot up off a sender if you want, but that's not the default configuration. So here you see I've got VDA and VDB. So VDB is that sender volume. Um, not very secure. All one word, all lowercase. So if I go back to, uh, so if I look at my volumes again and say edit attachments and detach that volume, then VDB should go away. And the way to think about sender, actually, uh, sender volume, is think of it as almost like a USB drive. It's not shared storage in any, it's not actually shared storage. It's a storage attached to a one in one instance only. But you can, uh, you can detach it at any time, and basically reattach it to a new instance at any point. So now you can see there's only a VDA now that it's been attached. And then the last thing is quickly Swift storage. Um, there's two things to understand about Swift. There's containers and there's objects. An object is put into a container. So I've got a test container that I'll create. And then upload object. I'm going to just name it test and then browse and upload my 
Anaconda Kickstart file for fun. So now we have this object. So the idea here would be if you went out to that instance and installed the Swift client, you could then use that Swift client to connect to Swift and pull down that object. So you can see how multiple instances could then talk to Swift. Um, couple resources. Uh, well, let's review quickly. We did. We started with Keystone at the bottom to authentication. We imported an image into Glance over here and then created networking. We launched an instance with Nova, attached block storage to it, and uploaded something uh, object to Swift. And then top corner over there, we used the web interface to do it. A couple resources. Uh, OpenStack Red Hat Com is where you can get all the RDO community bits. If you're a customer, we have some docs for Red Hat OpenStack at that address. Um, OpenStack.org, TriStack is that community cluster that I talked about before. Puppet and Django are, are underlying pieces that are used in OpenStack and for the, um, for uh, Puppet is used in PackStack. And then the last link at the bottom, I'll be posting the PDF of these slides here out to um, that location for you to download and I'll also put on SlideShare so if you search my name or Ken's name on SlideShare um, you'll be able to find both of our, okay. our slide decks out and there. That, and the YouTube video will probably be up in the next day or two. So um, we've got some, I realize not only do we have a few minutes but actually there's a break between 10.30 and 11. So, my, so two things, what, if, you want to ask a, if you want to ask a question and everyone wants to say to hear that question and the answer, please come up to the microphone in the middle if you can so everyone can hear the question. And then uh, afterwards, uh, people can also come and talk to us individually. Thanks so if you have a question coming. right now, I will go to the middle. Thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll also put that, the, uh, the, the glance image up in the same directory. So if you go to that Fedora People site, you can download that image. There's also a Fedora Cloud image that's pre-built as well, though. Uh, the difference is that there's Fedora provides it, and there's no root password to it. Mine has that not very secure root password on it. OK, it looks like some folks, if you have question. a question? Yeah, some, somebody had asked earlier about uh, live migration, and that's something I'm really interested in. Nova in has networks. support for it. And if you use shared storage, then it can be done. But, so would shared storage be the Cinder stuff? No, or because the Cinder is not shared thing? storage, right? Okay. So you essentially need, it needs, right now I think what is supported is an FS map. So yeah, so the compute nodes would have to have shared storage between them. So yeah, and not, or if you have some kind of um, like a like another file system layer in between that allows you to share share storage or something. Okay, thanks. So those floating IPs that we allocate on can, external network. Can everyone network? keep it down a little bit so we can answer questions, please? Okay. Hello. So Sorry, those floating IPs, there is a route to the external switch, right? And so that um, we can actually access those IPs outside, like a floating IP on Amazon, right? Same, same concept, right? Correct. Did we create that route in this demo? Did I create the route? Yeah. No, it's, it's kind of assumed that your network administrator would give you a block of IP addresses that are routable to the hosts that you're building OpenStack on. And therefore, when you use that, the, that block of floating IPs and tie that physical interface into Open vSwitch, it's assumed that those routes already exist. And so when you create that external network, you're making OpenStack aware of that block of IP addresses that are assumed to be routed, routable to OpenStack. So then when OpenStack puts that floating IP onto the interface and does the, the, the SNAT back into your instance, um, it handles the routing from the floating IP into the virtual network, whereas your network administrator is going to handle the routing from the outside world to that floating IP. Got it. Got it. Cool. Thank you. Yep. That's what he said. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Can morning. you use uh, VirtualBox to run RDO inside of VirtualBox, if you have, assuming you have no resources? Sure, yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, my recommendation is VirtualBox with Vagrant. Make life so much easier okay. doing OpenStack. Okay, thank I've been you. I've trying to get Dan to use it for a year now. <laughs> uh, but get him to use Vagrant? <laughs> to use Vagrant, yes. I'm, okay. just, I'm just using generic libvirt on a Fedora, Fedora on machine, laptop. So. But, it, but it's okay, it's cool, Yeah, right? I mean, it, the, the trick to doing that would be making, if you're gonna do this setup, making sure you can put two virtual NICs on your boxes, 
But if you want to do the all-in-one install, then absolutely. There's, there shouldn't be any restrictions that I know of to use whatever virtualization technology you want. Um, also realize, though, that when you launch an instance, you're doing nested virtualization because your node is virtualized and your instance is virtualized inside the virtualized node. So things will be slow. Slow, sure. But I do it all the time for demos and stuff, and if you can wait a few extra seconds, it works really well to learn off of and to demo. There was a question we had tabled about images. You set, uh, specifically, if you're running uh, EXXI and you want to pull that over to, I think the question was OpenStack. How do you do that? So several ways to answer that. First of all, it isn't uh, EXXI to OpenStack, it's EXXI to some other hypervisor. Because the reality is OpenStack can be used to manage vSphere. So it's not an either or. It's, it isn't OpenStack or vSphere, it's OpenStack or vCloud, really is the answer. That being said, the, the, kind of the, the two biggest problems today in terms of portability of environments, so you hear about a lot about moving from one cloud to another cloud or moving from bursting workloads up from uh, private to public. The two biggest problems today, one is data gravity, right? How do you move a lot of data, ter you know, terabytes of data from one cloud to another? I don't know, <laughs> unless they're all in the same data center. Number two though is image portability. So the reality is uh, VMware's VMDK image and KVM's QCAL2 image is not at all compatible. And there are no good tools at all in place today to, to, uh, to easily convert those images. So, uh, so the two ways around this is you would have to make sure that whatever clouds you're moving to, whether it's public-private or public-to-public -public or private-to-private, -private, use the same images, use the same hypervisor. Or the other way to do it um, is to, you, to not use golden images. And when I say golden images, I mean this concept of I'm gonna take, it, I'm gonna take an OS, load it up as much, every patch and every application I need, and then stick a snapshot and use it for an image. If you do that, basically you're, you've locked yourself in. So the way around it is to you don't use go to images, use the thinnest, smallest image you can possibly find, um, and then use a configuration management tool like Chef or Ansible or Puppet to do your configuration after the fact. Because that is actually transportable across multiple clouds and multiple hypervisors. So then if you need to move something, you essentially just find, it, find an OS on using a different image template, spin that up, and then use your configuration management tool to configure that image. Does, it, does that make sense? Yeah, it's this. But what I'm talking about, if you have an existing like ESXi image, VMDK, the conversion over is not very clean. So, this is the reality of things. Well, then again, you're, you're basically recreating the thing anyway. So, there's no easy way to import that and make sure everything come, trans, comes over. Top. Yeah, so, uh, I, L, is, there, is that clustering in the L2 yet, the L2 agent? I don't know. Neutron, I, know there's, Neutron, I know there's no clustering in the L3 agent. Neutron is, is new enough of a component that clustering and high availability is something that's still in the works. So it, it's actively being worked on. Um, yeah. Red Hat's been spending a lot of time on testing, um, balancing, and, and making Neutron highly available, having multiple nodes. And um, there's, there's a lot of issues that are still being worked out. Yeah. So. I don't know that it's fully baked at this point to the point where someone would say, yes, you need to run multiple neutron nodes and it should, it's going to work, but there's, there's lots of active work so, to, to iron a lot right, of that so, out. So uh, a bunch of different vendors, OpenStack vendors, have basically put their own solution to try to make neutron uh, more highly available. So for example, I know several of uh, the vendors have uh, put HA proxy kind of on top, layer that over the two nodes. Uh, so that when one fails, you can kind of reroute things over the other node. So, that, but there's no, as far as I know, there's no HA built into the core of Neutron itself, which is actually one of the problems today with deploying. So in Rackspace, <laughs> good question. So Rackspace, we actually do not use the L3 agent for production, for, pri for our private cloud. We actually use, um, we actually use uh, like physical switches, physical routers. 
because we don't think. So you can use neutron for the other pieces, but for production usage as an L3, we don't think that's a good idea. I thought you were going to say you use super secret sauce locked in a vault in the bottom of a. No, no, no. <laughs> We've looked at using HA proxy, but it's, there's, there's a lot of work involved there that that's, um, makes it difficult. Not a question necessarily, just a statement. When the thing about using ESXi images, I was going to say like OpenStack goes hand in hand with the whole DevOps thing about not relying on golden images. Yes, right. So it's better not to think in that direction at all. And I agree. Yeah, the only customization, as you guys said, we, we need is like we anyways need cloud in it and stuff which is yeah. required for the metadata, but minus that, everything should be handled by Chef or Puppet. Agree. To do right, that. agree. And, and, uh, the thing is, I think most people who grew up using VMware, grow up using VMware, are used to golden images. And um, the fact is that's changing, right? Because if you look at how VMware is doing their uh, vCloud hybrid service, they actually use Puppet. <laughs> so they actually are creating thin images and using Puppet to do configurations on them. So, so they're kind of coming around to it too. Oh, is it? Okay. You, you need that one? Sure. Any, any other questions? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's dependent on your, your situation. Um, I mean, if you need something that's super easy to set up, then GRE and VXLAN are going to be the easier way to go, but they're tunnels. That, so the, the, ca the traffic has to be encapsulated. Every frame that goes through, there's a header attached to it, and, and therefore you have to monkey with yeah. like MTU settings and stuff like that to be sure that your frames are going to flow through those tunnels properly and not fragment. So you're going to get much better throughput out of using a VLAN backend than using GRE or VXLAN. Um, the difference between VXLAN and GRE, which I actually just learned yesterday, I think, is um, GRE is TCP based and VXLAN is UDP based. So there's a little bit less overhead in using VXLAN because you don't have these long running TCP connections. It's all fire and forget UDP traffic. Yeah. So, so, so just it's, sorry. So just you know, the question was. Uh, which network model should you use, VLAN versus GRE or specific virtual overlay? So the, 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 the consultant's answer is it depends, right? <laughs> it depends on your use case. Um, I w what I will say is the future is clearly going to be virtual overlay, right? So we, we know we, in our private cloud, we actually support uh, GRE. We use, we use pieces, no, no, I said we don't use Neutron right layer there. 3 routing. We're using other pieces of Neutron. Oh, great. Thank we you. We still have a link. Thank you, I appreciate it. You can, yes. it's, it's but basically you can route it, you can actually talk to a physical router. So, but anyway, so the point is you, you kind of look at your use case um, and be prepared, but expect that uh, overlay networking is going to be the future. And also, oh, obviously, if, you, they're, if they're you're planning to grow at so. large scale, um, VLAN oh, could be a problem someday. So. Does someone have one of the USB sorry. keys to copy the image off of this gentleman was looking to copy it? <laughs> a first, <laughs> an overview of overlay versus underlay. No, so. Underlay network is, act, is actually a traditional like physical network with VLANs. A network overlay is basically uh, you basically abstract that away, and you basically can lay. That's the best way to explain. So it, you can actually have networks that aren't physically connected in the same <laughs> space, and you can act, and a network can actually span across multiple subnet uh, networks. Two, two phones yeah, were tunnels, found, so if you're between, expecting a, a call from machines. your distributor, I've got your phone. So, there's a, I'm not an, I, I'll be honest, I, I'm not a networking guy, so I know enough to be able to help architects and this stuff, but you want to get drilled down, uh, talk to Dan, or there's actually some great new sessions I would review. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so this is around the services uh, container. Uh, containers? I don't, uh, so the services uh, is uh, another tenant, right? A project. 
can I can there be multiple services? Overlay. I'm trying to create an abstraction he, where okay. the services that I put in is controlled by the security domains. If I have many security domains and I want to create a construct at the, the who can get access where, yeah. uh, say uh, a, a network service is exposed to uh, security domain A services project yeah. and then another uh, services for another network. Is, is that something that's exposed? Is it doable? I'm not sure. So we talk, well, I can't. In my head, I, can have, I have to picture it. <laughs> right. So can, uh, in other words, can I, there can be many services uh, projects. Right. And whatever that services project gets exposed to is, uh, I'm losing the train of thought. I, I don't, I need to talk to yeah, you. Yeah, we should talk with okay. you later. Okay. Thanks. So there are no other, you know, if there are no other kind of big global questions, um, I actually, I actually have to run in five minutes. Looks like Dan, but you can come up and ask questions. Looks like Dan can stay a little longer. Uh, and thanks again.